Hello world, it's finally happened. Screenshots showing the control center of the Pegasus spyware have finally been leaked, which reveal just what this infamous malware is capable of. So Pegasus spyware has been in the news a lot over the last few years, but we've never seen what it actually looks like behind the scenes until now. To give you a quick reminder, this spyware is developed by NSO Group. It primarily targets iOS and Android devices, and it's very good at it. Pegasus has been known to take advantage of zero-click exploits, enabling a victim's device to be hacked without them even knowing. Pegasus is sold to governments all over the world for, well, on paper at least, legitimate uses, such as targeting terrorists, kiddie fiddlers, and so on. However, this malware often makes the news when governments allegedly use it to target human rights campaigners, journalists, and so on. The rabbit hole in Pegasus runs very deep. I just can't cover it all here, but I'll make sure to link some of my previous videos on it below. However, in a nutshell, Pegasus spyware enables quintessential 1984 level surveillance, and thanks to recent screenshots being published, we now know what this threat looks like. The first thing that comes to mind when looking through these screenshots is just how awful the interface is. It looks like it was designed to emulate software from cringy hacking films. It's obvious this billion dollar company didn't reinvest much into UX. But anyway, the interface is really quite revealing. It shows that once a victim has been infected with Pegasus, an operator can do a number of things, like view the victim's messages from various apps, even the encrypted ones. You can see what looks like different Facebook and WhatsApp group chats that a victim is in, and full transcripts of each. In another screenshot, you can see that Pegasus can not only record calls, but it can turn a phone into a listening device, recording the device's surroundings. In the camera tab, operators can turn on a victim's camera and take photos. And of course, a target's location can be tracked via GPS, creating a complete map of their movements. Unfortunately though, there's a lot these screenshots don't show. Like, I'd be curious to see what miscellaneous features Pegasus has, as it's well known that Pegasus apparently has a self-destruct feature, automatically removing any trace of the spyware if the victim's phone hasn't connected to the command and control server in a few days. So all these screenshots come from a presentation the Israeli police were apparently making for their government to show them just how useful Pegasus could be to them. But this was way back in 2014, so these images are eight years old. But the reporter who published them said that according to his sources, the UI is still extremely similar, though the colors are different now. Next up, in a rare and surprising W for the Tor project's ongoing battle with the Russian censorship machine, the Tor website has been unblocked in Russia, not something I ever imagined I'd be covering. So Tor's website was initially blocked last December when a Russian prosecutor alleged that Tor allowed people to visit sites that host materials included in the federal list of extremist materials, which whilst this shouldn't be a reason to block Tor, his allegations were probably true, I suppose. The courts agreed with him and Tor's website was blocked in Russia. And just so we're clear, this ban only covered Tor's website, not the Tor service itself, but more on that in a second. The ban on the website persisted until recently when it was overturned. Now, if you're hoping the overturning of this decision represents some kind of a shift in policy on censorship, I have bad news. Whilst the ban was lifted, it was only done so because the lawyers representing Tor found a technicality that was overlooked in the original judgment. The court session passed without the participation of the site's owners, which in Russian law is a violation, and so the lawyers lodged an appeal, resulting in a new court judgment, which overturned the block. However, this reversal in decision will obviously have no effects on Russia's long-term ambition to exert more control over the internet. It seems like every few months, Russia unleashes a new wave of VPN bans. However, blocking the Tor service itself is much more tricky. Russia has blocked all Tor nodes. After all, those are publicly known and easy to block. You can literally just Google and find a list of all Tor's nodes. However, Russia has been much less effective at blocking Tor bridges. These are effectively Tor nodes which aren't public and exist to help people circumvent Tor blocks. The only country which has been able to block these Tor bridges is, you guessed it, China. Thanks to their internet infrastructure having been built from the ground up with censorship in mind, its design is a lot more centralized, so it's much easier for them to block things. Russia, on the other hand, has a much more decentralized internet infrastructure, which makes blocking a lot more difficult. When Russia wants to block something, the government has to tell ISPs to do the dirty work for them, which has very inconsistent results given each ISP will use a different blocking technique. This is obviously something Russia wants to change, but whether they'll manage to, well, I guess we'll just have to subscribe to find out. 
Next up, cyber criminals are being forced to improvise, adapt, overcome after Microsoft has finally started blocking Office macros by default. Malicious Microsoft Office macros make regular appearances on this channel to the point where they're getting pretty boring to be honest. But you might not have to hear about them for much longer because cyber crooks are finding new ways to hack into computers, leading to a 66% drop in the use of macros over the past few months. So for the uninitiated, Microsoft Office macros have been a cyber criminal's best friend over the last few years, as they've enabled hackers to embed malicious code within Excel or Word documents, setting the scene for a very believable social engineering trick, which typically involves cyber criminals sending phishing emails, asking someone in admin to check the attached invoice. An unwitting victim would download and open the document, which would then encourage them to tap enable content in order to view the mystery invoice. This button is the only safeguard Microsoft implemented standing in the way of malicious Visual Basic code executing, and if executed, it could do any number of malicious things. That being said, macros can be used legitimately, albeit by a minority of business customers to automate certain tasks. And because these business customers are very important to Microsoft, they opted not to kill macros outright, but rather implement changes so documents downloaded from the internet are unable to run macros by default. So how have miscreants adapted to losing their favorite toy? By switching to using malicious LNK files, otherwise known as shortcuts, recently the use of them has skyrocketed. Other than doing the obvious, pointing to another file, shortcuts can do pretty much anything a run prompt can do, like running something on the command line or a PowerShell script. But the big reason why cyber criminals love shortcut files so much is that for some strange reason, Windows has a feature whereby you can change the icon of a shortcut to anything you want, making them perfect for social engineering. The only giveaway being the little shortcut symbol in the corner and the file type saying shortcut. Though in fairness, these two things are easy to miss. And if you weren't educated on shortcut files, you probably wouldn't even notice them anyway. The situation isn't helped, of course, by the fact that file extensions are hidden on Windows by default. Aside from abusing shortcuts, miscreants have developed another trick, completely bypassing Microsoft's security changes to macros. So Microsoft's changes prevent Office documents downloaded from the internet from running macros. Windows does this via a mark of the web attribute, which is automatically appended to anything you download from the internet. It's kind of like a danger sticker. But miscreants figured out that they can prevent their malicious office documents from being contaminated with a mark of the web attribute by simply zipping them beforehand, because certain zip extraction software won't apply this attribute to its containing files. The problem is worse with ISO archives, because they use the FAT32 file system, which is simply incompatible with the mark of the web attribute, as it only works with NTFS file systems. Thus, Office documents hidden within an ISO archive, whichever extraction software is used, won't inherit the mark of the web, and so will run just fine. So as it turns out, we probably haven't seen the last of malicious Office macros, but at least they won't be popping up quite so frequently as they have done in the past. This video was made possible by PlexTrack, the cybersecurity reporting and workflow management platform that empowers continuous assessment and effective collaboration between teams to ensure you win the right security battles. Create assessment reports in half the time and collaborate throughout the remediation lifecycle. Centralize your remediation efforts across all scans, assessments, and audits with powerful risk visualizations, scanner and ticketing integrations, and enhanced analytics. Communicate risks clearly across your team and in real time, working more efficiently and effectively with PlexTrack. You can claim your free month of the PlexTrack platform exclusively for Satonic viewers using the link in the video description. As always, thank you for watching. Sources can be found in the video description. Stay tuned for more hacking videos and have a good one.